good afternoon. Welcome to EduSat Network. Friend, we are going to discuss environmental policies and program in India. And for discussion on this topic, we have introduced senior academician Dr. R. V. Singh. He is head of the uh, Department of Geography in Delhi School of Economics. And uh, Dr. Singh is also editor of a Springer series of advances in geographical and environmental uh, uh, sciences. And uh, Professor Singh is Vice President of International Geographical Union and member of uh, IGU, IUGG Joint National Committee of FINSA. He has uh, uh, delivered a lecture at different forum, national, international forum. I am, have also experience of uh, uh, practical uh, visiting to the different geographical uh, areas. So certainly his knowledge and experience and what the government framing policy, his involvement will help us to understand this topic and give insight how to look at this environmental policy in Puram in India. So on behalf, I welcome Dr. Singh for the EduSet lecture on this very topic. Welcome, sir. Thank you, Amrinderji. <coughs> Dear viewers, today within the framework of environmental geography, I would like to discuss with you environmental policies and programs in India. While uh, discussing environmental geography, I would like to explain a little bit about the conceptual framework and the approaches of environmental geography. Environmental geography deals with the special aspects of environmental phenomena. This includes natural aspects of surrounding, material aspects of surrounding, social aspects of surrounding. So, since a Stockholm conference, environment has become a very important instrument for decision making, for communicating to the com uh, community and policy makers in order to prepare sustainable development strategy. You know, uh, idea of sustainable development also came into existence in between. Now the question arises, how geographers can contribute to the uh, environmental geography? I would like to bring before you three important aspects, approaches of environmental geography. Landscape approach, ecosystem approach, and environmental perception and behavior approach. So through these three approaches, we contribute for global, regional, and local sustainability. For understanding the need of environmental policy and programs, it is required to understand the meaning of environment. And I, as I highlighted, environment includes biosphere, technosphere and sociosphere. It, it, you know, comprises all entity, natural or man-made, external or oneself and their interrelationship. So interrelationship is the most important aspects in this process which provide uh, value now or perhaps in the future of mankind. Thus, environment is the basis of human survival. Environment, but you know, in recent years, due to anthropogenic activity, due to human activity, environment is being degraded due to the several uh, channels of human activity. This includes agriculture, horticulture, industrial development, transport development, and various other human activity. You know, while discussing environmental problem and policy, we should see three important aspects of environment, particularly when we are dealing with the developing country, environmental issues of developing country. Here I would like to make a distinction between environmental problems of developed country and developing country. In developed country, we, we are getting the problem due to development. But in developing country, we are facing the problem due to development together with lack of developments. So here one can see the cumulative effects of both. I would like to bring before you three keywords while looking key environmental challenges, population growth, poverty, 
and careless application of technology. You know, environment is a public consumption good. It provides raw material to our all requirement. So, for basic needs like a fuel, food, fodder, shelter, all requirements are fulfilled by the environmental resources and it also provides raw material to the industry or various our productive system or uh, different activity. But when we do not uh, use, need anything, then where we throw, throw? We throw in the environments. So, in broadly, uh, in nutshell, I can say environment is also receptor of the waste. Here I would like to discuss with you the emerging issues and challenges, food security, water security, energy security, biodiversity and human health. These are the four important emerging issues to be tackled by any discipline. And so, environmental geography can contribute for achieving food security, water security, energy security, biodiversity and then how we can protect our health. Need for national environmental policy. Natural resources or environmental resources play a vital role in providing livelihood and securing the support of ecological surfaces. In this perspective, a need for a comprehensive policy has been evident to the various sectoral and cross sectoral including fiscal approaches to environmental management. There is a need for balance and harmony between economic, social and environmental needs of the country. And so, you know, now sustainable development has become a very uh, important key words in every walk of life. And sustainable development deals with economic aspects of sustainability, social aspects of sustainability and environmental aspects of sustainability. Here I would like to discuss with you global initiative taken particularly in the field of environment. You know I would like to go back to you know 1972 when UN conference on human environment was organized at Stockholm and it is very popularly known as a Stockholm conference. You know I would like to say that uh, uh, our head of Indian delegation, then Prime Minister of uh, uh, our country, Mrs. Let Mrs. Indra Gandhi, you know, mentioned a very important, you know, message to the global community in general, and particularly people and policy makers of the developing country, in particular. She mentioned that population growth and poverty. These are the two very important components of environmental degradation in developing country. And when I see today, I think these two are the very, very important aspects for managing our environment, for bringing sustainability in different parts of the world. Then I would like to go back to the onset United Nations Conference on Environment and Development in 1992. You know, it is very popularly known as Rio Declaration, Rio Conference, you know, many uh, Earth Summit also, we also we call the Earth Summit. You know, here I would like to main highlights include, you know, Agenda 21, Re, Rio Declaration on Environment and Development, particularly the 27 points. These are the very, very important questions to be tackled by the glo uh, global, regional and local community then the forest principles, then convention on biological diversity, then framework convention of the climate change, UNFCC. Then you know I would like to remember 2002, another very important uh, initiative taken by the global community, World Summit on Sustainable Development at in 2002. 
it is popularly known as also the Johannesburg uh, summit. Here actually uh, we discuss largely the future we want, sustainable development goals. Now I would like to come to the a few national poli uh, policies. Here I would like to start with the national forest policy of 1988. Then, you know, followed by national conservation strategy and policy statement on environment and development in 1992 before departure for Rio summit. Then Prime Minister uh, uh, Sri P.L. Narasimha Raoji, you know, proposed the national conservation strategy on the pattern of the world conservation strategy. Then, you know, I would like to mention about the policy statement on abatement of pollution in 1992. When I take the sectoral policy, then certainly I would like to mention National Agricultural Policy 2000. As you know, agriculture is the main stay of Indian economy and without tackling and dealing with the agriculture, it is very difficult to uh, promote sustainable development in our country. So sust uh, for sustainable development, we need also the sustainable agricultural development. And, and so that is why the National Agricultural a policy came into existence in 2000, followed by the national population policy. As you know, in, I highlighted these three triangular diagram, poverty, population and careless application of technology. And so the population control, population, particularly I would like to mention about the quality of population is very important and we have to deal with the quality of population. Then national water policy in 2002. As you know, the water, uh, if you see the population, we have the almost the 17 percent of the world population in our country, but only 4 percent of the fresh water resources. And so you can understand from your own perception the type of problem we are getting due to the enormous, you know, uh, population pressure and then uh, also the livestock uh, pressure. All these policy have recognized the need for sustainable development in their specific context and formulated uh, a ne uh, necessary strategy. Here I would like to mention, you know, uh, I would like to go back to the Tiwari committee report, you know, uh, before the uh, uh, 1986 environmental policy, before Tiwari, Tiwari committee report, you know, uh, brought before us the uh, various key components of the environment and we realize that not only the natural element but the cultural aspects are also very, very important. Then in 1986 also we implemented May 1986 Indian Parliament passed the Environmental Protection Act and then many new initiatives taken particularly for the protection of environment and this certainly we got the idea from the Stockholm conference and, uh, and several other initiatives taken subsequently by the global community. Then you know the national uh, environmental po policy uh, 2006 I would like to particularly mention and this national environmental policy six to extend just I would like to mention the two line six to extend the convergence and fill in gaps that still exist in nine of uh, uh, present knowledge and accumulated experiences. It does not displace but builds on the earlier policy. So you know this policy is not a totally a drastic change from the uh, you know earlier policy but it is in continuation and many improvement you know took place. At, uh, with this policy. Main objective here I would like to mention the healthy environment, a responsibility for a state and the people. It is recognized that maintaining a healthy environment is not the state responsibility alone but also that of every citizen. We need a partnership, a split of partnership should thus be you know uh, realized throughout the spectrum of environmental management in the country. The policy also seeks to, seeks to stimulate partnership of different stakeholders 
like a public agency, local community, academic and scientific institutions. The investment community and international development partners in, hearts, in harnessing their respective resources and strengthen for environmental management. Main objective here I would like to bring before you all. First, the conservation of critical environmental resources and certainly here we can take into consideration of the various you know sectoral resources like agriculture, biodiversity, forest, climate, intergenerational equity and in this context I would like to mention about this livelihood security of the people and particularly the uh, poor people, intergenerational equity, integration of environmental concern in economic and social development, we need development, development is a very essential for removing poverty because poverty is very important challenge before us and due to poverty we have enormous pressure on environmental resources and so that, it, that is why we need development and so the what we need development with ecological enhancement. Ecological uh, ecologically sound development need to be promoted or development without destruction should be promoted. Then efficiency in environmental resource use that is a very, very important particularly we are implementing in the area of energy. If, if, uh, environmental governance has become a very, very important earth system governance, environmental governance and then environmental of, uh, 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 enhancement of resources for environmental conservation. So, conservation based development should be promoted in our country. While dealing with the principle of national uh, environmental policy of 2006, uh, I would like to mention that human beings are the center of sustainable development concern. So, ultimately in all areas of human activity, human, man and nature or human and nature form the inseparable part of our life support system. You know, Chitijal Pawan Gagan Samira, land, water, air, flora and fauna, these are the very, very important essential aspects and whatever the basic needs, need of the people, we need but not the greed of the people. So, national environmental policy deals with the need of, need of the people and particularly the poor people. So, human beings are at the center of sustainable development concern, right to development. As you know, for a, for, uh, poverty eradication, we need development. Then environmental protection as an integral part of development process the precautionary approach, economic efficiency, polluter pays uh, uh, and the cost minimization, entity with incomparable values, these are the important. We need also the equity, the equal opportunity of people, uh, uh, you know, for balancing the huge of resources. Then public trust and doct doctrine because environment may be considered as a public consumption good. Decentralization, decentralizing the uh, activity at, and so that is why the new policy and more focus is being given to the uh, uh, involve uh, or involving the panchayats, local self bodies, so that more and more people should get the benefit the environmental standard setting and this such in the environmental standard should be based on the social, economic and political system of the country. Then preventive action, there is a say prevention is better than cure and so preventive measures are very, very important. Here I would like to mention, elaborate one two important point 
like environmental standard setting. Environmental standards must reflect the economic and social development situation in which they apply. We can't bring a new type of environmental standards. It should take care of the local environmental, uh, local natural resources, uh, social, economic and political system of the country. Environmental quality is not the only source of societal risk. Virtually every activity of humans is with risk. Risk uh, mitigation in each case involves societal cost, these must be weighted against the potential benefit. Environmental management system such as ISO 14000 by uh, requiring the adaptation of standardized environmental management practices, documenting their actual use and credible third party verification of the fact may significantly uh, ease the public burden on monitoring and enforcement of prescribed emission standards. Here I would like to mention about the few uh, regulatory reforms and some of the important guidelines and components of regulatory reform. Institutionalize a holistic and integrated approach to the management of environment and natural resources explicitly identifying and integrating environmental concern in rele relevant sectoral and cross-sectoral policy through review and consultation in line with the national environment policy. Identity emerging areas, uh, identify emerging areas for new legislation due to better scientific understanding economic and social development and development of multilateral environmental regimes in line with the national environmental policy. Eco leveling, eco leveling involved review of the entire product cycle from sourcing raw materials to that disposal of the product after use and since they are concerned primarily with consumer preferences may relate to external or ad hoc rather than natural environmental standards. Eco levels clearly have the potential to be employed as trade barriers at least by competing farms in the export destinations if not directly by their government. The obtaining of an eco label, especially one granted by an agency located in the developed country may involve large transaction cost. However, eco label products may command significant price premium as well as ease of entity to markets. Here I would like to mention about the policy and programs under the broad category of the environmental uh, aspects. You know, we have to deal with forestry, biodiversity, pollution control, land degradation, water management, climate change, marine and coastal environment, clean energy. Even in Indian context, we have variety of these resources starting from mountain in the northern side, then also the uh, great or little Indian desert in the western side. We have the peninsular India, then we have the Indo-Gangetic and Brahmaputra plain, the highly densely, densely Indo-Gangetic and Brahmaputra plain, then we have the coastal region many human activities are concentrated uh, within a few kilometer of the coastal area, particularly 100 kilometer of the coastal area. 
then our coastal regions are also prone to the variety of risk and disaster coming through the cyclone, tsunami and various other things. Then you know the clean energy, another important component uh, to be promoted under the policy and programs. I would like to take up the one by one all these policy. You know the forestry, particularly here I would like to mention the national forest policy 1988. One very important aspect is joint forest management program. In 1990, national forestry action program of 1999 national afforestation program of 2002 and national mission for green in india 2011 these are the important highlight national forest policy here principal aim you know of this 1988 made environmental stability and maintenance of ecological balance as its principal aim as it is vital for sustenance of all life parts it made clear that the derivation of direct economic benefit is subordinate to the principal aim. If it duly recognizes the rights of the tribal and other poor living near the forest. Joint forest management, you know, is a very important initiative taken in 1990. The central government outline a joint uh, forest management framework for creating a people's movement through involvement of village community for the protection, regeneration and development of degraded forest land. Under JFM, both forest department and lo local community come to an agreement to farm the committee that is known as Joint Forest Committee, Management Committee, to manage and protect forest by starting the cost and benefit. All these 28 state government and Andaman and Nicobar Islands had adopted, you know, JFM program by 2005. It covered 60 percent of the 170,000 forest thin villages. Now we have 29 states. National Forestry Action Program. This was launched in 1999 to address the issue underlying the major problems of forestry sector in the line of national forest policy. Its prime objective is to achieve sustainable development and conservation of forest resources through the involvement of all stakeholders including the local community. National Afforestation Program of 2002 was launched in 2002 by the National Afforestation and Eco Development Board set up in 1992 under Ministry of Environment and Forest. National Afforestation Program involves plantation in degraded forest of the country. It is a flagship program of national afforestation uh, program and provide physical and capacity building support to the forest development agency which are the implementing agency. National mission of green India 2011. In February 2011, Prime Minister approved the national mission for a green India, which is one of the uh, 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 eight national mission under India's action, national action plan on climate change. It aims to double India's afforested area by 2020, adding an additional 20 million hectares. Secondly, its objective is to enable forests to absorb 50, 60 million tons of CO2 annually, offsetting about 6 percent of India's annual emission. This mission will have repercussion for livelihoods of people and biodiversity. Here I would like to mention about this the afforestation based eco-conservation in the 
Gangotri Gomik area. In mountainous area, then also under the various other program in desert area also, we have the massive afforestation at, uh, along the Indira Canal project in under JFM, under earlier under the social forestry program also a massive uh, uh, initiative taken for planting the tree along the road, along the railway line, along the canals, uh, uh, in the also on the common lands. Uh, here I would like to mention the some of the important achievements as per India's state forest report 2011, total forest cover of the country is almost 21 percent of the geographical area of the country. And if you will consider the forest and tree cover, it is 23.81 percent because due to the uh, improvement in our uh, monitoring, forest monitoring technology you know using remote sensing, geographic information system, we are able to monitor the tree cover or the forest cover. The total forest area has decreased by 367 square kilometer, but the area under the, uh, the uh, very dense forest or moderately dense forest have been increased by 43 a square kilometer and 498 a square kilometer respectively. Till 2006, around 100,000 forest protection committee had been constituted across the 28 states and union territory and these forest protection committee manage about 22 million hectare of forest area. Then I would like to move to the biodiversity. Biodiversity includes three component, species diversity, genetic diversity and ecosystem diversity. About 7-8 percent of the world recorded plants and animal species are found in India. India known for its rich heritage of biological diversity has so far documented over 91,200 species of animals and 45,500 species of plants in its 10 biogeographic regions. However, the continual degradation of habitat due to degradation of forest, land and water quality has threatened India's biodiversity significantly and this makes India home to 9 percent of the world threatened species. I would like to mention a few programs related to biodiversity, particularly Convention on Biological Diversity in 1993, National Biodiversity Strategy and Action Plan 2000, National Biodiversity Action Plan 2008. Protected, protected area network. We have also the uh, uh, Biodiversity Act, National Biodiversity Act and Biodiversity Register. <coughs> Convention of Biological Diversity in 1993, CBD is popularly known as the CBD is the first global instrument to address all aspects of biodiversity. It was brought up as the Biodiversity Treaty at the Earth Summit in 1992 and India was the first signatory. Thus, India became one of its party. It focuses not only on conserving biodiversity, but also sustainable use of biological resources and equitable sharing of benefit arising from its use. CBD calls upon all its party to prepare national biodiversity uh, strategy and action plans for conservation and sustainable 
huge of biological diversity. Accordingly, India had developed a national policy and micro level action strategy on biodiversity in 1999. National Biodiversity Strategy and Action Plan 2000. It is a national policy document on biodiversity conservation released by Ministry of Environment and Forest on 6 January 2000. It is a part of India's obligation as signatory to the CBD. It is a macro level statement of policy, gaps and strategy needed for conservation and sustainable use of biodiversity. It envisages the assessment and stock taking of information uh, uh, related to biodiversity and the implementation of CBD objective at, at various levels in the country. It adopts a highly participatory process involving various stakeholders coming from the community and here also I would like to mention about the name, uh, highlight the National Biodiversity Action Program 2008. This entails integration of in situ on farm and ex situ conservation along with other measures to augment the natural resource base. This document pro provides the framework for taking action by the multitude of stakeholders in biodiversity including the people themselves for achieving the three objectives of Convention of Biological Diversity. Conservation of biodiversity is another important component through the Eco Development Committee, you know, uh, we have Biosphere Reserve, three layers of protected area uh, or islands of biodiversity I can say like uh, 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 biosphere reserves, national park and wildlife sanctuaries. Then another important component is sustainable use of uh, uh, its resources, then fair and equitable sharing of benefit arises out of their use. We have in India also the protection area network. The establishment of legally designed protected area is the principal method of in situ uh, conservation. Protected area as a concept was promoted by the IUCN and a large network of participatory agencies now exist across the world. Uh, at mac macro level there are 18 biosphere reserves including Sundarban. Gulf of Manar and Nilgiri which are included in the world network of biosphere reserves. At meso level there are about 100 national parks. At micro level there are about 500 wildlife sanctuary. Then I would like to move to the another important sector uh, you know dealing with the urban area like a pollution control initiatives and CPCB you know central pollution control board and a state pollution control these are the two very important agencies responsible for monitoring this. Then national air quality monitoring program, national Ganga river basin authority you know it was started long back and at present also the new government is also very much interested to development of the uh, uh, national waterways and uh, together with the uh, preservation of the Ganga. Uh, you know in this context I would like to mention that this should be promoted in a more integrated way involving tourism, uh, not only tourism but also the uh, you know uh, transport you know then also the uh, livelihood security of the people. Uh, even this program can be linked with the also the mountain conservation, you know this the highland area because ultimately all rivers are coming uh, from the Himalaya and there exists Himalayan highland lowland interactive system. 
Then we have the National Ganga River Basin Authority in 2009. These two agency, uh, you know, Government of India enacted the Air you know, Prevention and Control of Pollution Act 1988, 81 to arrest the deterioration of the air quality. The Act uh, prescribes various function for the Central Pollution Control Board at the apex level and a State Pollution Control Board at the state level. Some of the important function are collect and disseminate information related to air pollution, to inspect air pollution control area, assess quality of air and to take steps for prevention, control and abatement of pollution in such areas. National Air Quality Monitoring Program. National Air Quality Monitoring Program with objectives like to determine status and trends of ambient air quality, to ascertain and trends, uh, uh, to ascertain the compliance of national ambient air quality standards, to understand the natural processes of cleaning in the uh, atmosphere and to undertake preventive and corrective measures. The present national network includes uh, uh, 424 manual monitoring station across 175 city, towns and industrial areas and 48 continuous monitoring stations in 28 cities including 16 metros. The National Ganga River Basin Authority uh, was constituted on 20th February 2009 under Section 3, 3 of the Environmental Protection Act 1986. This the NGRBA like a National Ganga River Basin Authority is a planning, financing, monitoring and coordinating body of the center and the states. The objective of this NGRBA is to ensure effective abatement of pollution and conservation of the river Ganga for adopting a river basin approach for comprehensive planning and management. Land degradation in India. With 2.5 percent of the world land mass, India support 17.5 percent of the world human population and more than 20 percent of the world livestock population. The increasing population and competing demand for land has resulted in significant decline in per capita income availability of land from 0 0.89 hectare in 1951 to 0 0.3 hectare in 2001 as per uh, the Ministry of Environment and Forest. Natural factors such as high storm intensity, soil characteristics and climate condition, the land management practices and other social factors also contributed to such degradation. Here I would like to mention about the uh, landslides areas, particularly this photograph taken in the Gangotri area, in the exposed area after receding of Gangotri glaciers. Program and schemes related to land degradation. Here I would like to, this includes drought prone areas program 1973 integrated watershed development program of 1989, national watershed development project for rain fed areas of 1990, reclamation and development of alkali and acid soils, watershed development project in septic area in 1994. Drought prone areas program. DPAP has the major objective to minimize the effects of drought through the through an integrated development of the area by adoption of appropriate technology. Its 
main emphasis is on the irrigation projects, land development programs, afforestation, grassland development, rural electrification and other programs for infrastructure development relating to roads, market, credit, servicing and processing etc. At present the program is under implementation in 972 blocks of 185 districts of 16 states. Here through this data you can see that we have the uh, highest coverage in uh, some of the states like uh, uh, you know Maharashtra, Madhya Pradesh, Jharkhand, Karnataka, Gujarat, then Tamil Nadu and Uttar Pradesh. Integrated Wasteland Development Program IWDP was implemented by Government of India for improving the productivity of waste and degraded lands keeping in view of the poverty, backwardness, gender and equity. Development of wasteland mainly in non-forested area aimed at checking land degradation. Putting such wasteland of the country to sustainable use and increasing biomass availability especially that of fuel wood, powder, fiber, fruits and small timbers. Government of India is taking up this colossal task through its integrated wasteland development project scheme by revitalizing and reviving village level institution and enlisting people's participation. I would like to move to the northern part of the country and here you can see this mountain environment where most important as, uh, components includes the glacier snow and then forest and biodiversity. Northern Himalayan mountain incorporates typical land use like zoom and typical migration like a transhuman together with varied cultural groups like tribe with unique social activities. Moraines in the river valley you can see indi this indicates the glacier retreats. Reclamation and development of alkali and acidic uh, soil. From 11 5 year plan this program has been expanded for reclamation and development of both alkali and acid soil and renamed as reclamation and development of alkali and acid soil. Main objective of the program are reclamation and development of the lands affected by alkali and acidity, improvement of soil fertility by undertaking appropriate on-farm development application of soil amendments and growing suitable crops and horticultural crops. Plantation of suitable fuel wood and fodder tree as per local demand and suitability to soil capability. Plantation of uh, improving capacity of extension personnel and beneficiary in various aspects. Now you can see that the how flood and drought areas are very important for our country. The whole northern Indus, Ganga and Brahmaputra plain is very severely affected by the flooding and so such type of the watershed management program is very, very important. In this context here I would like to mention about the national project for repair, renovation and restoration of water bodies, integrated watershed management program, also the watershed development project in shifting cultivation area, this was also launched in 1994 particularly mitigating the ill effects of stifting cultivation by introducing appropriate land use such as, uh, as per land capability and improved technology. 
This also improves socioeconomic status of Jumia family through household and land based activity. Then I would like to mention about the national watershed development project in rain fed areas. You know in India has a 68% uh, area under the rain fed or the uh, dry land area where precipitation is less than potential above uh, port transpiration and so that is why for development of our country conservation development and sustainable management of these rain fed areas are very very important where we can enhance agricultural productivity in a very sustainable manner. We can restore the ecological balance, reduce the uh, uh, you know, regional disparity between irrigated and rain fed areas. I also like to mention the national project for repair, uh, renovation and restoration of water bodies largely dealing with the, this program was launched in 2005 for creating the additional irrigation potential, increasing the agriculture, horticulture, pisciculture, production and productivity, increase the recharge of uh, ground water, improvement in water efficiency, increase in availability of drinking water, promotion of tourism and culture. Then in, uh, integrated water set management program in 2008, more recent one, this integrated water set management program uh, largely uh, also uh, combined with the other drought prone areas program, desert development program and integrated water set development program. Now I would like to take a few minutes on climate change. This is a very, very important due to the resulting from the anthropogenic emission of the variety of gases. This would result in large changes in ecosystem leading to possibly catastrophic disruption of livelihood, economic activity, living condition and human health. And so that is why it is very important to deal with the various plan and action related to the climate change like a national action plan on climate change was implemented in 2008, a state action plan. Here I would like to mention a few action plan like solar energy, energy efficiency, sustainable habitat, the water, sustainable Himalayan ecosystem, sustainable agriculture and also the strategic knowledge for climate care. You know a state action plan also on the pattern of national action plan, the state action plan we are also uh, promoted cre for creating the state level institution and program. Uh, some of the Indian states including the Himalayan states like Gujarat and uh, also the Gujarat, Kerala and Delhi have been proactive in the addressing the climate change aspects. We have also the large area under the marine and coastal environment. Here you can see this the, uh, the typical the boat houses where the made by the local pe people. We have a long coastal line and we are getting a big problem due to this. In eastern coast, you know, mangroves were also replaced for aquaculture development. This is a very, very important threat in the region. And so that is why some of the initiative taken like a coastal ocean monitoring and prediction system, then land ocean interaction in the coastal zone, integrated coastal and marine zone management. Integrated coastal zone management and integrated coastal zone management also in 19 uh, earlier. Uh, I would like to mention also the some of the clean energy, energy efficiency is very, very particularly energy efficiency of the power plant, the energy conservation of building codes. These are the very, very important, you know, then one can divide, you know, this the whole environmental legislation in a different part like a first page where wildlife, water prevention was important, air prevention, but in the second page environmental protection act came, then hazardous waste management, environmental impact assessment notification also came. Then in third page we have noise pollution rules, ozone depleting, electricity acts. And the fourth page, I would like to mention about the right to information, forest right acts, hazardous waste rules, National Green Tribunal Act 2010. You know, many initiatives taken 
and many institutions also created in our country. And these institutions are playing a very, very important role, particularly for mountainous uh, studies or mountain environment like a GB Pant Institute of Himalayan Environment Development, then National Coastal Management Authority, National Environmental Engineering Institute. So dear colleague, you know, and uh, viewers, here I would like to mention that it is very important for us to involve the panchayats and women and in this the whole process of environmental management. Now I would like to conclude that last two decades have also seen an increased concern with environmental changes, especially climate change and its potential to make, uh, magnify existing stresses. To have a better understanding of vulnerable environment, Indian scientists fo should focus on how physical and human ecosystem operate and interact in the context of future earth initiatives. Understanding okay. complex resource environment interaction within a space uh, under the umbrella of environmental geography provides an important base for sustainable environmental management. Okay. So well friends, uh, with this word we conclude the lecture. I thank all of you for watching the lecture and on your behalf I thank Dr. R. V. Singh for giving such a wonderful lecture on this great topic. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.